Hello everybody, welcome back to Tim Man Collections and today I decided to pull out my North Carolina Ghosts and Legends book and I was going to read the, another chapter on it, out of it real quick. And this one's called The Whaler's Return. So, here we go. Most seafaring men had their suspicious side and so did Edward Pond. But he had no premonitions when his ship headed out to sea from its home port at Stonerton, Connecticut. His heavily muscled arms and rough scarred hands were used to hard work for he had been a whaler for some 30 years before signing on with the crew of the Charles Sprague. 30 years at sea? Uh, no thank you. Pond was unusually happy about this voyage just before Thanksgiving in 1886. The Sprague was a fine new three-mastered schooner with a long quarter deck. His only son would be serving with him as third mate the first time they have ever sailed together. Oh, that's good. A nice father-son get-together trip, anyway. On board, he watched the boy with pride. A tall, blonde young man, Sylvester Pond, was born and raised to go to sea. Only 20, he had a keen eye for how a sail should be bent and a strong skilled forearm that could make a coil of rope leap a twist like a river and snake. Wow, that boy's really strong. I'll be darned. They were only a few days out of Stonington when a moderate chop began, but it was hardly felt in a vessel like the Sprog. The crew awakened to hear raining Pelton the deck in every direction was a curtain of gray. The sun did not rise that day. But afternoon, the schooner Sprague was hurtling down the side of one mountainous wave and up another. Scudding before the storm, father and son were both on deck when it happened. In one billowing black onslaught, the sea boarded the ship. Veteran whaler Edward Pond look up to see a wall of water high in a, as a tidal wave. Suddenly he became a tardy, tiny particle of humanity encased in unbearably heavy wetness. Unable to breathe, propelled through endless reaches of blackness with momentum so great he thought he, it would strip off his very flesh. I would probably feel that way too if the water hit me so hard. I feel like it like, I don't want to be out that far away in the sea with big tidal waves. Were known. His chest was ready to burst. The pressure in his ears was excruciating, and he was almost unconscious when, with tremendous impact, the water hurled him against the side of the cabin. Seconds later, yawn. Its David broken smote him with such cruel violence that it crushed his limp body against the cabin wall. Sylvester managed to reach his father while he still lived and released him. He took his father to a bunk and arranged pillows around his bruised and broken body, but mercifully Edward Paul never regained consciousness. Five hours later, with his son's arms around him, he died. I would get all upset if my father died in my arms, I tell you. Oof. I don't know if I can bear it, but anyway. The fourth day of the storm was Thanksgiving, and the tempest raged on. The spring scuddily helpless before hurricane force winds. About midday, a monstrous wave reached up from the tumult of foam and blackness below, seized across the vessel in a second of horror. Sylvester Pond saw the towering gray green wall of water looming high above his head, and he knew he was doomed. The water crashed down upon him with stunning force. And swept him from the deck into the seething black cauldron below. He fought to come up, reach the surface, only to have an icy arm of a wave push him down again. His body grew numb from the cold. His will to live was fast evident. When he was lifted up in the grip of another mountainous wave, pulled under, battered, swept on with the sand of the shore scraping his flesh raw and then miraculously tossed upon the beach. Yeah, that, that was, um, 
I do not want to be in the water and then, you know, I get sink or drown or something. I don't want to be. The place where the limp, soddy bottom of Sylvester Pond lay was a narrow golden spit of sand off the North Carolina coast called Shaggle Fork Banks. When he finally opened his eyes, he was being cared for in the modest cottage of the fisherman. And it was not until the second day that he felt strong enough to talk. My shipmates, are they alive? He breathed weakly. I almost all of them, replied John Chadwick. We're taking care of them here at Diamond City. And my ship, still afloat, Chadwick nodded and Sylvester spent from his or deal, fell asleep once more. John Chadwick looked over at his wife and shook his head. He will have a long wait before he's fit to set sail on a way of voyage again, she said. What about the vessel? They're towing the ship into the bright, the, the bite to repair her. None can say when she will be seaworthy, for the mizzen mast lies broken in half across the deck. Yeah, a ship like, like that, I bet it would be too expensive to repair, but anyway. There were good shipwrights at Cape Lookout, but no one tall, strong trees. The problem would be to replace a timber the size of the Sprague's huge mesomash. Like Pond, the first Chadwick was a New England whaler. During the 1700s, the Chadwick men had lived on the whalers' huts of Shackleford Banks. Most whalers stayed for the season, but the Chadwicks came back to settle when the New England men who came down from for whaling went out to sea to search for whales. The islanders watched and then stopped waiting for Providence to wash the whales ashore. They boated out themselves. Harpoons held high to hunt the animals down. John Chadwick was a tall and rangy man with a sunburnt, heavily lined broad face and bright blue eyes. He was also a good man and he and his wife were soon treated Sylvester as they would have a son. Sylvester Pond would have been dead of exposure had not, not been quickly found. His body was battered and abraded from the sand, and he was painfully weak. He may get the pneumonia. You know, John Warren and Chadwick, but the young man was fortunate, and with the couple's good care, each day he grew stronger. At the end of the second week, Chadwick told him, You've been in the house too much, lad. It's a taste of the good salt air you'll need and a strong about the island. A stroll about the island. You want to thank John Etheridge, the keeper of the life saving station. Twas Joe who found you on Thanksgiving Day. I can't remember it. I'm not surprised. He said you were stretched out on the sand limp at a pierce of seaweed. And he took you for dead. Mrs. Chadwick's gray eyes were moist. Sylvester Pond soon knew everything about Diamond City on the eastern end of Shackleford Banks, all the way to within the shadow of Cape Lookout Lighthouse. Only the year before, Joe Etheridge had named the community for the unusual diamond pattern which made the lighthouse the most prominent landmark for miles. Chadwick took him on his own daily rounds over the island and Sylvester became familiar with the few stores, the factory to extract oil from Paul Poises, the oyster house, the small crab packing plant, and the church. A town of about 500 people. Is that all? Oh, good Lord, I thought they had more than that, but anyway. Diamond City covered half of Shackleford Banks and melted into a community called Whale Shore. Although it was not mid-December, the days were mild for here south of Cape Hatteras. Temperatures were warmed by the Gulf Stream flowing up from the south. Shackleford Banks, where Pond now found himself, was one of the string of narrow barrel islands of off the North Carolina coast and was separated from the mainland by shallow sounds. Created by narrow ribbon-like patterns of ocean beaches, sand dunes, luxury forests, and salt marshes, 
islands like Shackle Forth extended along the coast for several hundred miles. This world inhabited by Chadwick and the outer others bankers as the natives of the Outer Banks Islands were called the Tranquil. But it was also a place of strong winds blowing sand and glaring sun drenching the sand dunes, green meadows and marshes. Sylvester has spent his life on the coast of North England, uh, New England. He was at home on the busy streets of Stongerton and he loved the noisy docks ripe with the odors of fish. Spices and citrus fruit from the tropics. He had watched the slave ships washed down before he, uh, before they went back to Africa for another black cargo, and seen the loaded of flour barrel, beef, pork, and other comedies hand out for Jamaica and Barbados. It was a bustling port. Unlike the people of the Outer Banks, he had never really liked close to nature. While he was regaining his strength, he and Chadwick took long walks through the half light of the island's forest of myrtle, pine, dogwood, oak, and cedar. One day at the forest edge, he gazed out over a great grassy meadow at a wild pony, and its soft brown eyes stared back at him unafraid. Sylvester was fascinated. I've heard these ponies descended from Spanish horses. Yes. Swam ashore from ships wrecked off the Cape. The two men kneeled down and thrusting cupped hands into water. They drank from one of the small fresh water ponds. Sylvester grimaced and his mouth rebelled at the rotten egg taste that came from the marsh grass given off hydrogen sulfur by the flavor of the water on most of the islands. Ugh! I know I don't want to taste that type of water, but anyway. They climbed sand dunes covered with thickets and shrubs. A cottontail rabbit streaked off, and a startled catbird feeding in wind twisted trees emitted its peculiar squall. They plodded through soft, coarse sand mixed with broken bits of shell, and Sylvester realized he had not fully regained his strength. Once there, was a frenzy screeching and fluttering of wings all around them. They were surrounded by a dark cloud of birds, and Sylvester covered his face with his arms until the beating wings had fled. They had disturbed nesting turds. Beyond the dunes, the sea was calm and blue, and he could see a necklace of mullet fishermen pulling in their long net filled with a shimmering silver treasure of fish. The bearded young seaman began to experience a sense of peace. Here there was no hurry, but time for everything. At first the quiet and absence of bustle, the lack of concern over the passage of time frustrated him, but gradually a subtle change came about in the New Englander. He walked and waked each morning. And if the weather was gray and rainy, he accepted it and busied himself mending nets, caulking Chadwick's boat, or feeding livestock. There was almost something to be done. He read the large family Bible, one of the few books owned by the Chadwicks, and he began absorbed in the art of scrimshaw carving intricate designs on the whale bones he picked upon the beach. He Chaffed less often at the enforced shaping of his days and began to share the attitude of the outer bankers, accepting the reality that his life was entirely in the hands of nature and governed by its moods. Yeah, I know scrimshaw on a bone and everything looks actually interesting. Pieces of works of art. But during the evenings, pond sometimes grew re- Act uh, resident, uh, rest of. There was a little diversion save at Saturday night gathering in one of the homes of for church social. You need to go over to the church and get yourself a box supper and a pretty girl to walk home, John Chadwick advised. What if she won't let a stranger like me walk her home? Then I'll vouch for you. Saturday night, Sylvester 
and some of his fellow seamen gathered to a, uh, at the small unpainted church. He stared around him at all the shy looking girls standing stiffly holding the box suppers they had brought. No one appealed to him and he attempted to leave, but John Chadwick fixed him with a stern eye. No, you don't. At that moment, a slender girl in a dress of the color of pale green sea water slipped in the side door of the church. Her hair was dark and shiny, with patches of gold where the sun had gilded it. Chavik saw him looking at the girl. What's her name? Virginia Davis, and her box supper will go for a handsome price. Oh, man. Looks like he just found him a date. Anyway. Most of the suppers had been put up for bed and purchased by now, but not Virginia's. Sylvester felt encouraged, for there were only a few men left to bid on the remaining boxes. Then the auctioneer intoned loudly, What am I bid for Miss Virginia's supper? It's bound to be a fine meal. Three young men began the bidding, and then there were two, Sylvester and a heavy-set young fellow, Named Myers. I hope it won't Michael Myers. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I had to throw that in there, but anyway. He had an arrogant, almost brutal face, and Pawn took an instant dislike to a Myers made an inordinately high bid, and Sylvester topped it. Sylvester saw him start to bid again, but apparently changed his mind and remained silent. To Sylvester's surprise, the girl looked over at him frowned, but the box was his, and he attended to claim the privilege of sitting with her. He walked over to her table and introduced himself. At first, she was quite shy. There was a few visitors to the island, and Sylvester was an outsider. She treated him coolly as they began eating, but when Sylvester spoke of his liking for the banks, she was pleased and asked him about New England. He soon found himself attracted by her warmth and interest in her stories, in his stories of his boyhood boyhood. While a short distance away, the disappointed Myers sat glowering at them. Alright, I'm going to stop and go to part two. It's a long story. <laughs>